Okay, so we continue in our series uh, entitled Forbidden Topics, lesson that'll get you uh, criticized, called out, or canceled. This is lesson number 11 in this series. We have two more to go. This one, part two of this one, and then a final one, and then we'll be done for this series. In this one, we're going to uh, talk about genetic engineering, subtitled Playing God. One of the most controversial topics in our society today has to do with genetic engineering. The base science for this study is molecular biology of the gene. And this science is involved in the discovery of the method to recognize, describe, handle, and change the basic units of life. Every living thing is made up of genes and every living thing has its own genetic blueprint, if you wish, its own genetic code, which dictates what it is. Scientists have found ways to not only describe these genes, but also to manipulate the codes and recently to artificially reproduce these codes. So uh, science is really moving into uh, uncharted uh, territory here. So this is called genetic engineering. Many scientists agree that the last great scientific age was the nuclear age. The nuclear age was especially important because along with it, mankind gained the greatest power for destruction or human benefit in history, you choose which way you're going to use nuclear energy. It's very destructive or it can be also uh, very helpful. Scientists are now saying that the genetic age is now the greatest scientific breakthrough. Now the potential for danger and destruction is even greater because our power is no longer our you know, inanimate objects like the nuclear age. The power is over human life itself. It's one thing to be able to create a bomb that'll you know, blow up a city or two at a time. It's quite another thing to be tinkering with the, the building blocks of uh, humanity. And basically this is what they're doing. And so as Christians, we need to understand not only the issues and the problems inherent in the field of genetic engineering, but we must also be able to give an intelligent response concerning what the Bible may say about these things. And believe it or not, the Bible has something to say about these things. Not obvious, but if you look carefully, you will note it. We'll be sharing that in a little while. The church has been given the responsibility to be the pillar and the support of the truth, 1 John chapter, uh, 1 Timothy rather, uh, chapter 315. This means that our job is to speak the truth according to God's word, right? In John 17, 17, Jesus said, thy word is truth, thy word is truth. So we as Christians, we're responsible for speaking that truth and applying that truth in various situations. And that includes scientific uh, uh, research. Um, let's see, what else we got here? Now, whether people accept it or not, whether they believe uh, and follow the teaching or not, is not the point. We must proclaim the truth as the dividing line between truth and error and let the world choose where it will stand on this and on all issues. And God will judge, God will judge. But uh, we secure a firm footing if at least we're basing our opinion on what the scriptures say and not just what human beings say. So let's look at uh, genetic engineering, a little overview. Before we can give an opinion concerning a matter from a biblical perspective, I think it's necessary for us to understand the issue itself. None of us, well, maybe some of us are, but I'm certainly not a scientist, but we can learn enough about this field to at least offer an intelligent uh, opinion. So let's begin with a brief summary of the terms used in this field 
and some of the issues raised by the practice of geneticists. So there are two types of genetic research. First is genetic modification, genetic modification. This involves minor modifications in existing structures by splicing new genes into the DNA or into the code. For example, improving a certain vegetable's resistance to insects by reworking its DNA or its code, adding perhaps a booster uh, to the code that makes it more resilient, able to fight off you know, insects and disease and things like that. Or producing a higher yield of rice or several crops of wheat by restructuring its reproductive code. These are things, uh, you know, things grow according to their code. If you change the code, you change the way it grows. So, you know, there are a lot of genetically modified uh, crops. Using this technology to fight disease within the body of humans or animals is another way it can be used. So all of these genetic modifications, if used within proper guidelines, can benefit mankind, you know, uh, being able to uh, um, produce um, a more resistant type of rice, for example, uh, is very important to many nations uh, who, where rice is a, a staple of their, of their diet, or being able to kind of uh, you know, create uh, two or three harvests in one season, also uh, very uh, uh, important uh, for that, uh, for that uh, purpose. Um, uh, another uh, product of genetic engineering is the creation of new life forms. That's called human engineering. This type of research and practice goes beyond minor changes uh, to inanimate objects. In other words, the genetic engineering that searches to create new life forms or alter existing life forms. This is filled with danger, uh, dangerous moral and ethical uh, situation. It's one thing to make a, a rice crop more resistant. It's quite another thing to you know, create a, a human being in a, in a Petri dish. <laughs> not, the same, not the same thing. Okay, so uh, it's going to be this type of human engineering that we're going to review more closely and we're going to try to provide biblical guidelines, if you wish, for this. So let's take a look at human engineering and the Bible. Human engineering can occur at any one of four points. A, before conception, B, at conception, C, prenatally, in other words, before the baby is born, and postnatally. Now the various terms and practices fall into these four categories, and that's what we hear about. So human engineering before conception, before conception. So prior to conception, there are three areas involved in human engineering. One is uh, contraception, the preventing of conception using a variety of methods, some acceptable, condoms, birth control pills, so on and so forth, some not acceptable, abortion. Abortion is not an acceptable form of birth control, and yet in many countries, it's the major form of birth control. In China, for example, uh, in the past, was the, you know, if you didn't want the baby, uh, uh, you had an abortion. Uh, morning after pill, so on and so forth. Uh, another, uh, you know, another type of human engineering uh, is uh, sterilization, uh, tubal ligation, uh, vasectomies. These things are, you know, uh, fall, into this, uh, fall into this category of human engineering before uh, conception. Uh, there's also genetic screening the ability of doctors to predict the probability of certain diseases in children born to certain sets of parents by studying the genetic makeup 
of the parents. Now this is useful in, in many ways. For example, parents with a high probability of producing sick or handicapped children can either be treated or precautions can be taken with the pregnancy itself to avoid or to treat the illness. Now, if the illness or the deformity is a, a very high risk, parents may seek alternative ways to have a family, uh, perhaps through adoption or perhaps wait for a solution uh, medically. Screening during pregnancy also provides some opportunity for preventative care for sick or deformed babies. And I'll talk about that a little later. So the, the potential problem with genetic screening is that many times the doctors will recommend abortion as a solution. In other words, the couple will come in, they'll have some genetic screening and say, oh, that baby, that, you know, that little embryo there, we can see that it's going to have this problem or it'll be blind or it'll have, you know, whatever, an illness or something like that. And so let's have an abortion, let's not do that, let's not have a handicapped child, you know, let's avoid that by having an abortion and you can try again. I'm not saying that happens every time, but it's one of the recommendations made uh, to uh, parents. So if parents have a screening that has a risk, many times they're encouraged to go ahead and try anyways. And if the child is ill or deformed, well, we can always abort it. You can try again later. If a mother is found to be carrying a deformed child, she also has the opportunity of having an early uh, abortion. So uh, genetic screening, can help parents avoid the burden of conceiving ill or deformed children. It can also alert doctors to early treatment and prevention. It can prepare parents in the event that they are about to have a sick child. However, as Christians, we cannot support the idea of abortion as a way of dealing with ill or handicapped children. Very simple, Exodus 20 verse 13, thou shalt not kill. You know, it's not, it's not, a, uh, it's not a, uh, a very complicated uh, problem to uh, understand. The, the mother is carrying a living child. That living child may have an illness or a deformity or something. The solution to that is not to kill the child. That's not a solution. Not one that's acceptable to Christians anyways. All right, the next stage for human engineering is at conception itself. We've discussed human engineering before conception. Now let's talk about human engineering at conception. Human engineering at conception takes, again, four forms. One, artificial insemination. Two, in vitro fertilization. Three, gene editing. And four, cloning. So we're going to talk about the first three tonight and we're going to save cloning. It's a bigger subject. We're going to save that for next week, part two of this, okay? Let's talk about artificial insemination. One of the most difficult problems a good marriage can face is the inability to have children. And we've all heard it before, right? We've all probably even said it before. Uh, for ourselves or for someone we know in our family that we love, so on and so forth, who want children badly and they can't have any. You know, they're ready to provide a wonderful home and a family and they just can't get pregnant. Then you have this other person over here, you know, uh, uh, not a good mom, not taking care of her household and she's having babies, you know, no problem, you know, and it always seems so unfair. We don't control any of that. That's, an, that's unfortunate. Well, in artificial insemination, uh, it brings up uh, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, problems when people can't have children. I think of Roger and Diane who are, he's the preacher for the church in Montreal where we worked for, for many, many years. They, uh, they tried to have children, first 15 years of their marriage, 15 years. They tried to have children naturally and they made two attempts at adoption. Uh, uh, both of them failed for whatever reason. 
and after many prayers, she finally became pregnant naturally, 15 years. They'd already been married 15 years, they had a new baby, and then guess what? Two years later, whoops, they, they had another baby. So you know, this is a very uh, you know, unpredictable uh, type of situation. Now, not all people are blessed in this way, however. Some people become desperate and they try many methods, fertility drugs, adoption, foster care. Sometimes the drugs don't work and the hassle and the expense of adoption is also too much. For many people, their last two options are to either remain childless or resort to what's called artificial means. One of these artificial methods is called artificial insemination. Most couples who turn to this method, usually referred to as AI, artificial insemination, now we've got artificial intelligence, I don't know how they're going to tell the difference between these two, but anyway, it's called AI, because the husband is infertile or subfertile. So women tend to have more fertility problems than men, but in about 10 to 20% of the cases, men are the ones who are infertile because of either you know, low sperm count, faulty sperm, poor ejaculation, impotency, all kinds of things like that. So when these problems are the cause of the infertility, doctors may recommend artificial insemination. Now there are a variety of ways to do this and not all are acceptable for Christians. There's AIH, for example, where the husband's sperm is collected, treated, and then artificially joined to his wife's egg. All right. This is acceptable because the same partners in the marriage are donating their own reproductive materials with some technological assistance to produce their child. That child is all them even though they had some technical assistance in producing that child. They continue to be one flesh. The Bible says, you know, they became one flesh, uh, Genesis 2, 24. Now uh, in AID, here someone else's sperm, a donor, or a mixture of the donor and the husband's sperm are mixed and added to the wife's egg. This is unacceptable because the basic one flesh unity called upon by God is violated. This is not adultery because there's no lust, there's no lying, there's no breaking of any marriage vows. This way to produce a child violates a more primal law and that is the original law that existed before adultery was even possible the law or the principle of one flesh. The two shall become one flesh. And so when we introduce someone else's sperm or someone else's egg other than the spouse's, we then break that one flesh unity that has set as the basis for creating a family. In other words, you're adding genetic material from a third person. And that breaks the one flesh principle. It's not always an easy decision, but it's not worth violating God's law to produce a child when, these, uh, when there exists other ways of obtaining children in our uh, society. Another type is uh, in vitro fertilization. This is another form of human engineering at conception and it's called in vitro, meaning in glass, vitro, glass, vitre en français. It refers to the practice of combining the sperm and an egg outside of the woman's body and then when the egg is fertilized, placing it back inside the woman in order to complete the pregnancy. This is a difficult procedure and theoretically would be acceptable from a biblical context if the husband and wife's sperm and egg were used exclusively and then placed in her thus again. The principle that you're going by is the one flesh principle. Even though they have to mechanically put the two together, the materials come from the husband and the wife and no one else. So the in vitro procedure uh, uh, can work, but it does have some potential 
uh, for uh, evil. Some of the good things that happen is that a childless couple can have their own child. But this technology could be used to breed you know, better animals, thus improving uh, quantity and quality of food available. But this uh, procedure uh, has many troubling factors as well. The one flesh principle could be violated as any sperm and any egg could be used to produce a child. Producing random children in this way goes against the biblical principle of the family. Children are the product of love and commitment and spiritual blessing, not just a lab experiment. You know, in Psalm 127, the psalmist says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward uh, from Him. So human beings uh, uh, could be produced simply to provide body parts for other human beings. Nothing, I've read lots of articles that talk about this, this idea. Imagine that, you have in labs, they're growing body parts to, you know, somebody you know, lost a hand, we're growing a hand over here, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna operate, we're gonna put a hand on somebody. Surrogate motherhood and fatherhood reduces a human being's essential nature to that of a machine. It violates the order of the family. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. You know, a lot of things we can do, it doesn't mean everything you know, we can do, we should do. We have compelling reasons. We have the technology to do something, but we don't always have the right to do it. And so this in vitro production also destroys life because many of the embryos that are created are also destroyed during research. And many are disposed of because they're deformed. Oh, we don't need these anymore. We just get rid of them. These are living beings. Living beings produced artificially, but they're living beings. This not only violates the biblical laws against killing, but also goes against the basic principles of medical, um, medical uh, ethics. There's been a debate over this uh, stem cell research uh, done with uh, embryos. You can harvest stem cells other ways. Uh, what's his name, Kim? Kim Wall was talking about that the other day, all the battle about getting the stem cells from embryos is a moot point now because they've discovered other ways of getting uh, stem cells. Uh, there are uh, many uh, uh, ethical guidelines that are violated by these things, not just biblical guidelines. For example, uh, medical ethics states that a subject must be informed of the risk to his or her health and give informed consent. Well, these embryos, these humans, they're not consented, they haven't given consent. They're conceived and then they're killed in the dish to provide experimental material or body parts for someone else. Well, that's not acceptable. Basic ethics requires that the testing should be to the subject's advantage. To create a life simply to destroy it or provide a body part for another life is not uh, to the subject's advantage. It's not to that subject's good. And so the Bible promotes family, the having and raising of children, but not at the cost of destroying human life in the process. And certainly not if it violates the one flesh principle uh, in marriage. Uh, uh, human life whether it is conceived naturally or whether it's conceived with the assistance of genetic engineering is still a life in the image of God and worthy of respect and care and the right to live. Once you've created an embryo, that child uh, has a right to live. And uh, we, we don't have a right to play God and say, this will live, we don't, ne we don't need these anymore, let's just get rid of these, we'll only keep the ones we want. Now the most recent human engineering process is called gene editing. Gene editing. 
the newest kind of genetic engineering, gene editing, uh, or uh, what's called CRISPR. CRISPR, sounds like a candy bar, but it's not. Developed by the uh, Berkeley biochemist, Jennifer uh, Dudna, who won a Nobel Prize for her discovery in 2020. Dr. Dudna and her team adapted the system that created a genetic tool that can edit human DNA. You know, we have a, we have a video, right? We make videos here, uh, mostly of uh, the teaching that I do. And if I make a mistake or something, I stop and, you know, and I, I take my breath and I keep on going. And I know Hal is going to be in you know, his office with his uh, big computer and he's going to edit it. He's going to snip and slice and pull all the bad stuff out and put it all together and make a hero out of me. You know, that he can, we, we can do that. Well, basically uh, this scientist has figured out a way to do that with the DNA. You know, take it apart, add something, put it back together. I mean, it's amazing as far as science is concerned. Uh, DNA, you know, uh, popular kind of look there, is the short form name for the, uh, for the molecule that contains the genetic code of organisms. DNA is in each cell of, for example, a human being and it tells the cells what proteins to make. So the DNA is the blueprint that dictates uh, who you are, whether you're male or female, you're tall, you're black, you're thin, you, you've got brown eyes, all of that information's in the code. It also contains information that dictates future blindness perhaps, or certain handicaps, or certain genetic diseases. That's also in the code. What Dr. Dudna developed was a way to edit out these destructive genes as well as edit in favorable ones. That was quite a discovery. The net result of this technology is that first, we can remove before birth potential handicaps mental deficiencies and diseases. Marvelous. I mean, let's face it, your daughter, right, is pregnant with a baby, right? And Dr. Dudna, you know, as one of her doctors says, I can go in and just, you know, splice up because that baby will be blind. But I can go in and I can repair what's broken there so that the same baby is going to come out and be able to see. How many of us would say, oh no, we don't want to mess with that. Let, let, let the child, I want my grandbaby to come out blind. Well, that's not the end of the world. I've known blind people. They've had rich and rewarding lives. But if you could, if you could avoid it, wouldn't you? So there's some, some, some positive stuff there. The net result of this technology is that first of all, we can remove before birth, as I said, potential handicaps and mental deficiencies and diseases. We can also, not such a good idea, we can also create designer babies, selecting gender, eye, hair color, even levels of body strength and enhanced mental capabilities. I mean, we can do that now through this type of technology. The age of the superhuman is here. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine going in and you, they give you a sheet of paper, you know, boy or girl? <laughs> oh, I want a boy, okay, here. Just fill this out, you know. Check off what you want. I always wanted a boy with blonde hair and blue eyes and uh, tall, uh, this, you know, be able to sing. I want him to have a nice voice, you know. You know, check, check, check. Good at math, nah, it, it's not important to me. <laughs> I mean, I'm exaggerating here, but we're, we're going in that direction, being able to just artificially create uh, children uh, to our, uh, to our uh, liking. Um, but uh, a darker 
um, scenario uh, is the genetic development of armies. There are governments today that would use this technology simply to harvest the crop of you know, military people, men and women who are designed to fight, men and women who have a, you know, a sense of aggressiveness, whatever. Genetically modified armies so the danger to the human race brought on by tinkering with the actual building blocks designed by God for human life, very, very dangerous. Like I said before, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. And thankfully the Bible gives us uh, some uh, direction uh, as far as uh, that is a concern. So there's some uh, very uh, powerful tools that are out there being used now. And we need to uh, understand this to be able to answer uh, questions uh, in our own families about uh, issues uh, having to do with the genetics and uh, you know, uh, preconception um, activities and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Processes uh, that can take place. You know, maybe one of your granddaughters are going to say, you know, the doctor said we could do this or we could do that. You know, is that okay? Is that biblical? You know, you need to you need to know this type of material to be able to give a, a, an answer. All right, I'm going to stop here because I don't have enough time to do cloning. So we're going to do cloning. Uh, next week I'll be cloning. And then the following week, if the Lord is willing, we're going to finish off our series with a lesson on prejudice. And we're going to talk about critical race theory, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff that seems to be going round and round these days. We're going to talk about that. All right, that's our lesson for tonight.